And welcome to everyone to our webinar about Virtuoso 3.0. And I'm joined today by Ken Ward in Portland, Oregon to help us explore the function and feature of this major upgrade. Hello, Luca, and hello, everyone. It seems like we just did a webinar on Virtuoso 2.0. <laughs> yes, it does. And can you believe that was last year? If you never watch episode six of our OEMpedia series that are available on the Odison official YouTube channel. Perhaps before we get into Virtuoso 3.0, Luca, we should cover the concept of Virtuoso before we get started. That's a good idea, Ken. So the concept behind Virtuoso is transparency. <laughs> and glass is transparent, but low quality glass can distort the lights. High quality glass does not distort the light, but the highest quality glass is reserved for optical lenses which focus the light without distortion. So a virtuoso was originally a highly accomplished musician, but by the 19th century, the term had become restricted to performance, both vocal and instrumental, whose technical accomplishments were so pronounced as to dazzle the public. We have chosen a virtuoso in Mongol. His uh, name is uh, Joshua Heifetz, and it it's one of the most influencing classical musicians of the last century, also known as the Fiddler of God. He stated that there is no top and that there are always further heights to reach. And I believe this states very well the concept leading the project and the development of the Odison Virtuoso. Now, a great deal of early audio equipment had high distortion, limited frequency range, and poor stereo separation. Audio electronics have improved by a great deal since those days. And for many years, Audison research and development has worked to create electronic designs which preserve the waveform signal without damage or distortion. And here is what we reach after 35 years of audio development. Odison Virtuoso, a processor with 12 inputs, 13 outputs, featuring the most advanced in-car audio floating DSP. The frequency response of Virtuoso is 10 Hz, 44 kHz, and the distortion is only 0.004%, four thousandths of a percent, and the signal-to-noise ratio is 1 of 4 dB on the main input, 110 dB for optical, and keep in mind the CD standard theoretical maximum is 98. Virtuoso has 80 dB of channel separation when 30 dB is the analog reference standard. Delay is adjustable in 0.04 milliseconds, equal to 1.4 centimeters and 0.6 inch, and this is thanks to the high sampling rate. The capacitors, the operational amplifiers, and the digital to analog converters have been carefully selected to match with high level audio upgrade components. And the Shark Digital Signal Processor IC is a studio grade device and the most advanced DSP in any car audio processor available. And today, we announce more capabilities that are enabled by this powerful DSP engine. So, that's the Beat Virtuoso processor, and we truly believe it's the most advanced automotive DSP in the world. It's also been very successful in the market, and we are very happy to, about the reception. Today, Audison is introducing Virtuoso 3.0. Thanks, Luca. Welcome. Now, today's discussion will be organized a little bit differently than some of our other webinars. Uh, to show everyone how Virtuoso is improving, we're going to start with the simplest improvements, and then later we'll show you the all new capabilities that are unique to Audison and, and new to the car audio world. Okay. So the unifying theme for all of these upgrades is to help dealers tune music systems in cars to sound amazing more efficiently than ever before. So before we dive into the technology, I'm just gonna list some of the improvements to the functions of Virtuoso for a moment. So let's see here. So the first one is very simple. When For years, when I, we tuned cars, I would put the key in the ignition and turn it to the accessory position so that the radio would turn on and then the amplifiers would turn on and then I could tune the system. But as you know, 
recently cars stopped coming with ignition key switches and most of them have a push to start button. And when you push that button to turn on the accessory circuit, it often will turn itself off a few minutes later to prevent us from accidentally draining the battery. And this is a real inconvenience when mm -hmm. we're trying to tune an audio system. Mm -hmm. So we have a feature now on Virtuoso called PC Power On. And the Virtuoso will remain on as long as you have the USB cable connected to the Virtuoso and to your computer. So if the head unit turns off, you can walk up to the front of the car, turn the accessory back on without losing any of the information. Wow, installers are going to love that. Push to start cars, team time out all the time. Anything else like that? Well, some installers have told us that they don't like parametric EQ mm -hmm. and they prefer the old style graphic EQ. Mm. So you can now use Virtuoso in graphic EQ mode. Yes. You get more EQ bands and you don't have any of the parametric settings to worry about. You can see that the uh, the frequency center and the bandwidth are blanked out. And the only thing you have to worry about is gain up and down. Mm -hmm. And this is going to affect all three equalizers in Virtuoso, the input EQ, the output EQ, and the main global EQ. Well, that's nice. And some people will love it. It just seems to me like a shame to use Virtuoso in a graphic EQ mode, doesn't it? I understand. I love my parametric EQ. Um, but at the end of today's presentation, I will have a surprise that will work even in graphic EQ mode to make better sound. Okay, I like that too. Now, what else do you have? So one of the longtime advanced features of Virtuoso has been dynamic equalization. And dynamic equalization lets you tune the system to have different response level curves at different listening levels. So one of the ways you can use this feature is you can tune the system differently for the different sensitivity of human hearing at different levels of listening. And let me show you what I mean by this. So the researchers Fletcher and Munson were the first ones to measure and explain this concept where we don't hear bass and treble as well if the listening level is low, but we hear bass and treble better when the listening level is high. And so the Fletcher Munson loudness curve is named after them. Now, you might not use this as your goal. You might be tuning the system differently at high and lows for some different reason. But in the past, if you wanted to use this Audison feature, you had to restrict yourself to using the volume knob on the DRC as the master volume control. Now, the newest way to use dynamic EQ is going to let you be compatible with the OEM volume control. You can see in the upper left here, you select DRC volume or input signal as the reference to change the curve from high to low. And that opens up a lot of possibilities and you can use this with the volume buttons on the steering wheel. Exactly. So my other car is getting Virtuoso 3.0 this week, and I am really looking forward to tuning it with dynamic EQ for just this reason. Now, a, a similar version of this is dynamic bass boost. Uh, we had bass boost in the previous version of Virtuoso, but with dynamic bass boost, you can set it up to be different as you change your volume. And that also sounds like a cool feature. Come on, keep them coming. All right, you remember the configuration wizard from Audison, right? Sure. It lets you define the input channels, set input levels, and define the output channel assignments for your system. How can I forget this? Audison brought it to the market. So for years, if you needed to edit the configuration, you had to go back to the beginning of the wizard and you had to repeat each step. And now you will be able to edit either the input or the output configuration settings without repeating all the steps. Whoa, installers would love that too. Go on. I think, I think so. <laughs> so we now also are going to have digital signal sensing on automatic optical input too. So if you connect uh, a, a digital source and you want to select that, you don't have to have a toggle switch and you don't have to use the DRC. You mean I can start playing the digital audio player and it switches automatically? Oh, this seems like a nice list. Okay, that was the list of the simpler upgrades. Now, here is a bigger upgrade. Um, Virtuoso 3.0 has a real-time analyzer built in. Mm. And you can use it with your USB microphone that you already have, 
or you can use it with your USB sound card and an XLR measuring microphone. And if your microphone is a high quality measuring microphone that comes with its own unique correction file, you can import the correction file to get the most accuracy out of the RTA. Now, the way the software is designed, as you can see on the screen, you can see the RTA window and the EQ window at the same time. Now, there is also advanced target curve support. You can select from a number of preloaded target curves. You can create your own target curve. You can save the one that you create, and you can import new target curves into the system. And that is going to enable mobile amplitude correction. And so when your microphone's connected, you can actually ask Virtuoso to set the EQ for you to your selected target curve. Automatically, but this just sets the EQ, right? It, yeah, it's a basic EQ setting function. You are still going to need to set your own levels and set your delays on your own like before. Okay. Some people like so EQ. Mm, is that it? Oh, no. There's more. Really? So some technicians around the world have been using REW to measure the response and to EQ the system. You knew that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I heard that. So Virtuoso 3.0 is going to support you importing the recommended EQ file from REW directly. Okay. I, I don't use that automated process, but I know some people have just had to try it. Now we have more, here's a big one. So the output all pass filters have been let loose. We can now define them with any center frequency we want. They're no longer associated with the crossover points. The freedom for the all pass filters, right? <laughs> but I'm asking all the time, what are all pass filters and why are they a big deal? Well, they're a big deal because they're a way for us to manage phase. Okay, now, can we pause with the new features for a moment and maybe you can explain phase for us? Okay, that might take a minute, but I think it's going to be worth the work. I think the subject of phase is kind of like the subject of economics. It's complicated, and a lot of the people that think they understand it, they, they don't really understand <laughs> it. It took me a long time to get to a point where I have a basic knowledge, but I think it's really important that we understand it better. That's okay. We have time. Okay. So here is a waveform, and you may remember from our OMPedia webinars last year, whether an audio waveform is electrical and it's traveling on a wire or on a circuit board, or it is a mechanical wave, uh, it's the motion of a speaker cone, or if it is acoustic, it's the air pressure pushing on our eardrums, they're all fundamentally the same waveform. Now, phase shifts can affect sounds in the air, and they can affect electrical signals that haven't become sounds in the air yet. So when sound travels through air, it travels relatively slowly. And for this reason, if we have two speakers and they play the same sound, but they're different distances away from us, the sound won't be synchronized when those two sounds meet where we, where we are. And when the two identical signals are not synchronized, when they collide, you might get a problem called partial cancellation. And this is one of the ways that your room can change the sound of the speaker system. And I have some some uh, charts to help explain this. So here is a picture of a sine wave signal. And as you can see, we have marked the phase at each point in the wave. So it starts right here at the center point at zero degrees. And then the signal swings positive. And right here, it's at 90 degrees. And then it swings back to the center position. And then it's at 180 degrees. And then it swings negative. Now we're at 270. And then it comes back here and it's at 360 degrees. Now a circle has 360 degrees and so does a cycle. So we've just created one positive negative cycle in our wave. And 360 degrees for the previous wave over here is now zero degrees for the next cycle. So if the first cycle ended at 360, the next cycle begins at zero and then we go back up to 90 again. Now, something that's really important to remember about RTAs is that they are um, a real-time analyzer cannot measure the position of the wave. It only measures the amplitude of the wave or the height, but it doesn't know where these peaks are positioned 
as you can see the, on the chart where they're positioned. Now, this becomes important because let's say, for example, we have two waves that are identical in height or amplitude, and they're lined up. The peaks line up. You can see the red and the blue traces have the dips in the same spot and the peaks in the same spot. And we refer to that as being in phase. And if we add these together in this example, you can see that each wave had an 80 dB, uh, uh, went up to 80 dB. But if you add them together, it actually goes up to 86 dB. Mm -hmm. So you have more, you have a taller wave than you had with either signal on its own. And this is kind of intuitive for us because we expect two speakers to be louder than one speaker, right? Now, here are two waves of identical amplitude, but one of them is phase shifted 90 degrees relative to the other one. Now, if you measured each of either of these with an RTA, you would see the two waves as identical because it doesn't measure the position. It only measures the height. But if we add these together, you can see that we lost 3 dB worth of information. And remember, 3 dB is half your power. We lost a lot of power because these two waves were not aligned. And that is a form of distortion. Even if the wave still looks pretty and we don't think it looks ugly, we have distorted it because we lost some information or we lost some energy. Now, here is the same sort of thing, but the second wave is shifted 120 degrees compared to the first wave. And if we add these together, there is no net change in amplitude at all. It didn't get any louder. Once again, that's a form of distortion. We lost a lot of energy. Now here is one where the two waves are 150 degrees apart. Now we end up with less energy than we started with. You can see on the chart, neither of, uh, both waves were up to 80 dB initially, but now neither added up to that. So we have a big problem here, but watch this at 180 degrees. <laughs> we had two waves that were identical and they disappeared. We lost our signal. Really? Just disappears? Yes. Now let me give you another example. Um, have you ever wired two subwoofers in an enclosure? Do they get louder? Mm, yes. Two subwoofers are louder than just one. Of course. Sure. Right now. What if you accidentally hook one up backwards? Uh, yes, I did. And all the bass disappeared. I've done it too. I think we've all made that mistake <laughs> once in our business, at least. <laughs> and this is a very simple example of what happens when you shift phase 180 degrees, because if you take the positive and the negative terminals and you hook the wires up backwards, you flip the phase upside down. And now the two waves cancel each other out. So when you do this with subwoofers, they're very close together. They play a very limited range of frequencies that have a really long wavelength. So the cancellation is really significant. If you make this mistake with other speakers and they're smaller and they're farther apart, then the damage is spread out. It affects certain frequencies, but not all frequencies. And so it's not as obvious when we hook up a cabin speaker right. backwards. Now, if you have a home speaker, they usually have more than one driver in a home speaker. And to... A home speaker designer, a good one, is going to use crossover filters with their home speaker. And crossovers, we usually think of those as protecting the speakers from traveling too far, and that's essential. But they also keep the drivers that are adjacent to each other from interfering with each other in the transition band where both speakers are playing the same note. Now, most speaker designs do their crossover filters in the analog domain using passive crossover filters. And these analog filters have side effects. They cause some distortions, they have some limitations. And one big one is that they shift the phase of the signals that pass through them. So when you're a speaker designer, you have to be really careful to select the right crossover filters and wire them properly, or you might cause the same problem we're trying to prevent. Now let's take these home speakers and let's put them in a room and make sure you sit in the center, directly between those two speakers. Why right in the center? If you sit closer to one speaker than the other speaker, then the path that the sound travels from the closer speaker is shorter than the path from the farther speaker. Then the sounds arrive at two different times. And if the sounds arrive at two different times, it causes a big problem. 
these are phase cancellations from that sort of problem where the sound from one side is getting there early and there's a partial cancellation. We lost a lot of energy at certain frequencies. Now, once this happens, we cannot equalize this out. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So, so hold on. Are you saying that stereo only works in one listening position? Yeah, basically. And in home stereo, we call that position the sweet spot. Well, okay. So now we've got the speakers in the room and we're going to play music. And some sound comes out of the speakers and goes directly to our ears. And we call that direct sound. Now, some of the sound is not going to come to our ears. It's going to hit something and be absorbed by it. In this example, it's going to be soaked up by the sofa cushions. So some sound is going to hit something hard, like the surface of the wall or the glass in a window. And those sounds get reflected. And eventually, they will bounce around the room and reach our ears. But they're going to reach our ears too late. They're going to arrive a few fractions of a millisecond later than the directed sound, than the direct sound. Yeah, so it sounds like an echo? Oh, well, fortunately, it doesn't sound like an echo because that would be horrible. Um, it turns out that humans can't hear a delayed sound as an echo until the delay is way out beyond a significant limit. Uh, and that's a greater delay than will happen in most listening rooms. You have to get into a really big room like an arena or a concert hall to, to hear echoes like that. But you do get partial phase cancellations again, and they're usually not quite as bad because sound is attenuated as it travels through the air. So the delayed sound is usually not the same intensity as the direct sound. Excuse me. So it's good that the cancellations will not be quite as bad because in the home, some cancellations, you either have to move the speaker or you just have to live with it. Now, there is also sound that is diffracted. It will hit a hard surface that is irregular rather than smooth. And the example in the home is usually books in a bookcase. But the example in a car is a dashboard or a center console. Once that sound gets scattered, it is very difficult to discern where it is coming from. It loses the directional component. Uh, okay, so we can get face problems from the crossover filters. And we can get it from speakers interfering with each other. And we can get them from the room too, right? That is right. Now let's take all that and put it in the car. <laughs> Come on. Home speaker cabinets won't fit in a car. Well, I don't know. I think this guy did a pretty good job. Maybe we should <laughs> offer him a job. So let's take all the speaker drivers out of the cabinet and let's put them where they fit in the car. Oh, now so it's better. <laughs> in this installation, you can see the woofers are here in the door and the mid ranges and the tweeters are installed in these custom A pillars. So the speakers have now been spread around the cabin a bit. They're no longer on the same plane. They're no longer at the same distance. The distances have changed. And we might have even installed speakers in the back of the car. Oh, no, not that, please. I know. I'd like to joke about rear speakers. But <laughs> rear speakers can cause additional cancellations. And the louder the rear speakers are, the worse those will get. And that's why we use delaying cars and to put everything back to a synchronized arrival. Yes, that is correct. And like stereo, delay only works for one listening position. But it works. And it solves a lot of the problems that I've mentioned. If, if we use delay, we can make stereo work in that sweet spot. So now let's play music through this installed speaker system. Now, the car cabin is very different from a home listening room. We've got different cushions. We've got more glass. The glass is really close to us. We've got no parallel walls. The speakers are also very close to us. So it's a really different environment. One huge difference is that the volume of air in the cabin is much smaller than a room in the house. So the environment is completely different. So you're going to still have the upholstery absorb some sounds. You're going to have the metal and the glass in the windshield and the windows reflect some sounds. And you're going to have the dashboard and the center console diffuse and scatter some sounds. So by the time the sounds have all reached our ears, some of them end up being louder than we wanted. And some of them end up being quieter than we wanted. And this looks like a mess, but it is a simplified example. Both the amplitude and the phase errors get pretty chaotic in a car. 
So one tool that we have to, to make the system sound better is an equalizer. And equalizers make some notes louder and some notes quieter so that we can end up with everything close to an equal level of sound. And we don't lose any details that are being drowned out because the adjacent note is way too loud. So we talked about one problem with equalizers is we can't equalize out most phase cancellations. A different problem is that equalizers share a trait with crossover filters. And Luca, can you guess what that trait is? Let me guess. Let me guess. Uh, they have phase side effects as well? You got it. <laughs> Seems like everything has five phase side effects, eh? Yes, it does seem that way. It's kind of like we start here and we have these nice orderly waves that are all in harmony. And then we end up here with chaos. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and, and this is one reason that some professionals have not worried about phase in the cabin very much because the problem seemed chaotic and impossible to solve. But stick with me. We have some answers. Mm. So Virtuoso 3.0 has a cool feature that will actually show you the effects of the DSP processing that you have selected on the electrical phase of the signal coming out of the DSP. And so this is a way to help you avoid causing problems that you weren't aware of. And you have to read phase graphs really carefully though. Most of us aren't used to reading them. For instance, this chart right here might appear to be telling you something bad, but it's actually very good. So you want to really pay attention when you read these phase charts. So now we've described two thirds of the car audio problem with phase. We have to make the speakers work together and we have to make the speakers work in the vehicle interior. So the last problem for phase with car audio is what is the source unit doing to the signal? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have an aftermarket source unit, the answer to that question is almost always nothing. The signal is not changing. But if you have an OEM source unit, the signals coming out of those are increasingly being changed, both inadvertently when they use equalization and on purpose. Uh, the OEM sound tuner is trying to make the OEM system perform better, and they may use EQ or phase processing to do it, and that will affect our results. So we have to deal with phase errors in our speaker setup. And we have to deal with phase errors in our cabin acoustics. And we have to deal with phase errors in the signal from the OEM source unit. Yeah, that's all correct. Well, that sounds really depressing. And how do we do deal with that? Oh, cheer up, Luca. We're already fixing a good deal of them by using delay properly and by carefully selecting our crossovers. Hmm. So if you're a skilled technician, you can use DSP to correct problems and minimize the damage that's done to the sound by the tools themselves. So as an example, I mentioned that technicians often tune cars using a real-time analyzer, and that lets you compare the magnitude at the various frequencies. This example is a one-third octave real-time analyzer. So it measures the energy at 31 bands, and it's designed to work with a pink noise signal. And if you played a pink noise signal through it that was unmodified, you would see a flat line all the way across on top of all the bars. If you plug a microphone in, the microphone generates voltage at different frequencies, and then it displays the energy at those frequencies at the same time. And remember what I said before, an RTA is not going to help us measure phase. They detect the height of the wave, but not where the peaks are. So, but let me give you an example. That doesn't mean that we, we don't have any uh, information going on. Let's say I have a car and I play a pink noise signal through the left speakers and I get this magically smooth response all the way across. So then I mute the left side and I play the right side. And now I have that magically smooth response coming from the right side. And I'm like, great, my car is gonna sound awesome. And then I play both sides and I get this. Wow. Now, if I'm an experienced technician, I immediately know those are phase cancellations. I don't have to measure the phase to know this is a cancellation problem. It's obvious to me if I'm an experienced tuner, if I didn't have any problem with speaker one, I didn't have any problem with speaker two, and I have a problem when I play them both together, it's a phase problem. Um, let me give you a different example. Anybody who's tuned a car has seen a dip on the RTA and tried to get rid of it with the EQ and poured energy into that dip and it didn't change at all. The dip 
just remained. Yeah, and why is that? Because if you have two speakers whose output is interfering with each other and you add more energy to both of them, they just continue to interfere with each other. It's like the example of those two subwoofers. Right. If we wanted to solve the problem and then we gave more energy to both, the problem still remains. The, the, the energy coming out is equal but opposite still, no matter how far one speaker moves, the other one is moving just as far in the opposite direction. So let's think about the problem of the door speakers again. When the left door speaker and the right door speaker play the same information, we get these cancellations. And this is associated with one of the complaints we've heard about tuning to a target curve. If a technician blindly tries to match a target curve, and doesn't think at all about possible phase problems or microphone position problems that are related to phase issues, the sound could be worse than when they started. So we can't fix these with EQ. We often fix many of these cancellations using delay, but you can also address cancellations by manipulating the phase directly. And you do that with all pass filters. Aha, uh -huh. we came back to all pass filters. Finally. Yeah, so it was a long walk. Thanks for sticking <laughs> with me. So Audison has improved the functionality of the phase control in the all-pass filters on the outputs of Virtuoso 3.0. And all-pass filters let you flip the phase on a signal from 0 to 180 over a defined range of notes. So if you have a phase error in the acoustic domain, now you can address it directly if you so choose. Uh, but Virtuoso had all pass filters on the outputs before, yes? Well, yes, but they were not completely freely right. assignable. Right. Now you can set them to any frequency that you need. And you can see on the software here that you can actually select the center frequency just like an EQ band. And mm -hmm. this lets you address cancellations that you can't address with delay or can't address with an EQ. Oh, so... With Virtuoso, you can correct the phase on the input signal, and you can preserve the phase through the DSP, and you can correct phase errors in the acoustic domain using the old pass filters? Yes, that is correct. Wow, that is a lot of new technology. Well, there is one more thing. Really? Remember how Virtuoso was designed from the beginning to use the Shark DSP chipset? Yep. Uh, this is a floating point DSP chipset, and most car audio DSPs are fixed point, and this mm -hmm. is very powerful. And the reason they chose this was that Audison always wanted to use FIR mode. Which, uh, FIR stands for finite impulse response. And traditionally, DSPs have used IIR, and that's what's used by all the other automotive aftermarket DSPs you can buy today. And IIR computations have the same phase shift side effects as analog passive filters. So this has affected all DSP processors? Yes. Every DSP processor I've tuned, other than Virtuoso, has had this challenge. And if you're a skilled technician, you had to process, you know, you had to be careful. You had to minimize the damage you were doing to the sound. We talked about that a minute ago. You had to be careful with your crossovers and careful with your equalization. But FIR computation allows us to define the resulting phase shift as part of the calculation that has to be made. So if you want the phase shift at the end of the FIR computation to be zero, you get to define that. So FIR mode will eliminate any phase side effect from crossover filtering or from equalization that we talked about before. Now that seems like a big advance. Uh, is that new with 3.0? This part is not brand new. Previous versions of Virtuoso software have had FIR mode to make sure the phase shift coming out of the Virtuoso was zero. Now, there's also a feature in here called D-phase, and this is not new either. We talked about this last year. It was yeah. new with 2.0. And this is how you take the input signals and make sure that they match in phase before you tune the system. And 3.0 does have internal improvements to the D-phase process. Audison has tested more cars and more improvements have been made to the standard approach. It's the standard thing. Things are always improving. So to recap, Virtuoso will help you correct the phase on the signal coming in. And it has FIR 
mode to avoid causing any phase side effects while processing the signal. And it gives the technician control over the timing and the phase on the signal coming out? That is correct, yes. Okay, but how do we know the acoustic phase? Do we have to measure it? Well, you can measure it, but it is very complicated to measure the phase. It is a lot more complex to measure phase and then interpret the results than it is to look at a real-time analyzer graph and interpret these results. Uh, it, it has to do with detecting the height of the wave and the position of the peaks. So what I usually do is I deduce phase cancellations by carefully comparing the RTA reading with one speaker and the RTA reading with two speakers to make sure there aren't any changes that are bad. Um, some advanced installers are using REW or perhaps other software tools to measure phase directly. And REW is a free program that can measure both phase and amplitude. And like I said, it will recommend those EQ adjustments, but you still have to manage the phase errors yourself manually. Free? So I'm going to download REW right now. Well, hang on a minute. I know it's free, but <laughs> impulse response and phase measurements are not simple. First, you take the measurement and then you have to interpret the measurement. And learning how to do that takes a lot of time. So this is an impulse response chart. And I have to say, I don't think there's that many of us technicians who would easily interpret a response chart like this. <laughs> and this is a phase chart. And this is very different from an RTA. I don't think it's intuitive to any of us to look at this chart and identify where the signal is in phase and where the signal is out of phase. So it's easy to make a mistake. So if you don't know the phase of the signal, we said you have to be really careful to avoid making things worse, right? Mm -hmm. So should we measure phase or not? Well, this is the biggest new thing about Virtuoso 3.0. What is it? Do you remember the bit tune? Yep. Well, the bit tune can measure acoustic phase. Wow, okay. So remember, Audison used the shark so that Virtuoso could use FIR mode and avoid the phase side effects that are inherent with IIR computations. But FIR computations allow you to define the phase shift as part of the calculation. So if you want the phase shift at the end of the FIR computation to be zero, you can define it to be zero, if, or at least you can if you're on the Audison R&D team. But here's my question. Did you see Avengers Endgame? Yeah, but what does it have to do this with Carodio? <laughs> well, how did Ant-Man travel in time? He would enter the quantum realm, and then to come back, he had to define where he was going to re-enter the time stream. He had to decide what time it would be when he came back. Well, what if when we use FIR computations, since we get to define exactly what the phase shift is going to be, we define that so that all the sounds come back into phase acoustically at the listening position. Well, don't we want phase shift to be zero? Isn't it already zero? Well, we've only been making it zero so far in the electrical domain before we send it to the amps and speakers. Mm -hmm. Once it's played by the speakers, it enters the acoustic domain Got and it. the phase gets changed by the speaker locations and the acoustics of the cabin and all those reflections and absorptions and everything. So what if we were able to align all the waves that ought to be aligned? And we haven't been doing that because we don't know what all the phase shifts are at the listening position. So how do we know what all the phase shifts are at the listening position? We measured it. Yes, we use the bit tune to measure it. Now the bit tune uses the hearing simulation microphone, which measures at five points around your head and it will spatially average them out so that we eliminate any high frequency artifacts that might only occur at one tiny point in space. And our hearing system would ignore that because it's such a tiny point. Um, is this what some people are trying to do when they wave the microphone around? Yes, 
But when you're using the HSM, the BitTune can avoid the problems of the human head blocking some of the speakers and masking the high frequency response since your head is in the car. And in addition, most of the target curves that people are using have been defined with no one in the car. No one's leg is blocking the door speaker or anything like that. So your accuracy of your results is improved if you yeah. if you do and this without somebody in the car. <laughs> I knew waving the mic around was a bad idea. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So there's still one problem. So measuring phase and interpreting the results, it's pretty complex, even if you just have two speakers. Most hi-fi systems have at least five speakers, and they usually have more. So what happens is BitTune sends the measurements to Virtuoso 3.0, and Virtuoso interprets the phase results for us, and it uses the Shark DSP processor to perform the FIR calculations that are required to correct both the phase and the amplitude. So Virtuoso uses a revolutionary algorithm that has never been used in cars before or anywhere before, the Percept cabin correction algorithm. It was developed by a consortium of Italian universities, and it uses a combination of FIR and IIR filters. So it corrects phase and amplitude both at the same time after the measurement is taken. And the reason this is really important is that it can, it can correct more phase errors than you can possibly address in a manual process and much more quickly. Now, it's a digital room correction algorithm and digital room correction algorithms have been tried in cars, but the core algorithm was designed for larger rooms. So the results were not as good as people hoped. The Percept digital algorithm was created specifically for vehicle cabins. And this is the magic of Virtuoso 3.0. It'll measure the acoustic phase at the listening position, use FIR, correct for both amplitude and phase using that Percept algorithm. So this is like the ohm correction systems. Uh, so the technical doesn't have to try and interpret the phase. Oh, well, that sounds amazing, but some dealers don't like this kind of auto-EQ functions. I understand. Existing auto EQ functions have had limitations. Uh, some Audison research shows that one of the biggest issues has been the target that they've been trying to reach hasn't been defined properly. But this is not auto EQ as we've experienced it before. This is actually digital room correction designed for cars. So first Virtuoso corrects the phase errors on the input using the dephase process. And then it corrects both the acoustic phase and the amplitude errors with FIR and Percept. Uh, Why? Well, let me recap. So we are correcting phase errors in the OEM signal and preventing phase errors from the speakers interfering with each other and from the crossover filters interfering with the signal and from the equalizer interfering with the phase of the signal and correcting for the phase error caused by the room. And we are correcting all of that. And I don't have to learn to read those charts. <laughs> yes. And we're doing it while delivering the target frequency response that you choose. Oh, wow. That really sounds amazing. But does it work? <laughs> yes, I have been part of the beta testing program, and I can assure you this absolutely works. I have one in our, my, in our Subaru. When I run the process, it only takes me a few minutes, and I get a great result. Uh, it even got the subwoofer. Uh, so there is a two-seat option in there as well, and it's called Percept Overall, and it is an option to use when you have passengers. It is not intended to replace a one-seat tune, which is considered to be the reference. So. Because this measures phase and amplitude and then corrects phase and amplitude, it is different from any of those previous auto EQ processes. Wow. And the original Bitune had the flat response. Target by default. Not many people like the sound of a flat curve, do? Oh, I understand. I do not enjoy the flat response in a, in a car cabin either. And many dealers tell me they want to use their own target course rather than flat or any other target? Yes, I use my target curve and I have a ramp up from the mid-range up to the subwoofer and it hit the whole thing just fine. 
so I can use the BTune 3.0, correct both amplitude and phase, and get great results? Wow, that the Audison R&D team has really outdone themselves this time. This is amazing. I agree. And that is a wonderful use of this technology, but what if we don't have a BitTune? If you don't have a BitTune, you can still use the internal RTA and use your USB mic or sound card. Mm -hmm. You can use it for manual tuning if you want, or you can try the automatic EQ setting process that's in the RTA, which is not as advanced as the, yeah. as the um, Percept correction with mobile phase correction. So you can also use REW and measure phase and amplitude and then import the EQ filter recommendations. Now, if you choose to go that direction, please remember you're sorting out REW on your own. Tech support's only gonna be able to help you with importing the files. Again, that is amazing. I think it's fair to say this is truly something that's not available from anybody else in car audio. I can wait to install a new Virtuoso to get these features. Well, then I have more great news. Really? Virtuoso 3.0 runs on the existing Virtuoso hardware platform. We didn't have to make any hardware upgrades to run this software. So the hardware is the same, you're saying? Yes. If you already have a Virtuoso installed, or even the original Bit1 HD, you can upgrade to 3.0 performance with a firmware and a software upgrade. And it's the same thing with BitTune 3.0. If you upgrade to BitTune 3.0, it only requires a software update. And when you do that, you actually get an improved full screen RTA when you use the BitTune RTA function. And that is easier than it used to be. Some people don't know this, but last year, Audison unlocked all the measurement functions of the BitTune without a special license being required. So you can use the RTA or the oscilloscope or the other measuring tools, but the RTA is my favorite and it's now a big full display. So it's a, a great tuning tool for any pro beat processor. So with Virtuoso 3.0, technician can correct phase on the input signal. They can avoid phase errors in the processing and they can measure the output signal phase both manually and automatically using the Audison cabin correction process. Yes, that is correct. And when you're tuning the system, you can do it automatically with the internal RTA, and you can use the auto EQ if you want. You can do it automatically with the REW auto-generated filters. You can do it automatically with the BitTune using the mobile phase and amplitude correction for both. This is the most comprehensive way to do it. You can also do it manually using the Virtuoso parametric EQ and delay like we've been doing bit processors for years. You can do it manually using the parametric EQ and the all pass filters because they're now freely assignable. And you can do it manually using the graphic EQ and then delay or all pass filters. And yes, after you perform the mobile phase correction, you can do any fine tuning you want with the graphic EQ if that's what you want to do. Oh, and no one else on the market offers a list of options like that. And 3.0 gives traditional manual tuners more tools than ever, than ever before. And also gives us a new level of automatic tuning with Audison cabin correction. But when can I get it? Well, I'm testing it right now. The final software and firmware mm -hmm. upgrades will be available to everyone next month. Oh, that's good news. Now, in conclusion, at one time, only rich people could afford to hear music perform in their homes. Then public performance started to bring music to the general populace and music became very democratic. And now we can hear recording music nearly anywhere. But where can hear this music alone and without interruption better than in our cars? So some believe that high fidelity in the car is impossible and we at Audison have been overcoming the obstacle to automotive high fidelity for decades. And this is where we have arrived, Virtuoso 3.0, the finest automotive sound processor in the world. And as usual, we have covered a lot. And now we have arrived at the question and answer section. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the page to interact with us. Thanks. So. Let's open this up. Oh, nobody wants to go first. 
Come on, guys, keep on coming. Are you amazed by the new functions or too many questions on the table? You know, no one is asking me how I worked Ant-Man into this. I'm really bummed. Oh, oh got... hey, Holger, how you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Ciao, Steven Seiler. Hey. Luis Sardinia. Oh, the usual, say. <laughs> hey, Mr. McNulty has a really great question. Are there any USB mic option recommendations? Um, we are going to publish a one pager with a list of gear that we've tested. Uh, one that has been tested already is the Behringer uh, XLR microphone and then the mini DSP USB microphone. But we're going to publish a list of gear that has been uh, uh, tested and confirmed. So there's another one. And, uh... <laughs> Jakey wants it sooner. <laughs> hey, Carl, how you doing? Uh, Patrick Klinger, thanks a lot. Thank you, Patrick. And hey, those... Alejandro, thanks for those great slides. Those were very helpful. Impressionante, uh, Alex. You see, when does... Mike, Mike, Mike Clemens, keep it in the park. Uh, let's see here. Hi from Peru. Uh, pleasure, Anatolio. So Steven says Steven Siler is one of our um, demo car and yeah. very experienced person from Austria and is very interested on this system will change sound when I update my virtuoso in the SL55 AMG. Um, I think it might be having a good boost, isn't it? So a question from Manfred about an older version BitTune. My understanding is that all BitTunes can be upgraded to 3.0 and you don't have to upgrade the firmware uh, to do that. It has to be the, the current firmware, but the software is all you will need to update. Uh, Dimitri has a nice question too. Dimitri from Russia, of course. Um, hey, Dimitri. What kind of musical or test tracks are suitable for all pass filter adjustments? Um, when I am setting all pass filters, and I intend to publish more information on using these tools later this year. Um, but one of the ways that I will do it when I'm testing by ear is I will play a sine wave that should sound like it's in the center. And if it is not sounding like it's in the center, then I will use the all pass filter to put the two channels back into phase so that it does appear in the center. And that's something I've developed over a couple of years of playing around with this. I wouldn't use music for it because music has too much, too much content that is not affected by the all pass filter for it to be as obvious. So I really like to, I'm, I'm not that smart. I can only pay attention to one thing at a time. So <laughs> I would just use a sine wave or maybe segmented pink noise. Okay. Juan Carlos uh, from Mexico says hi. Ciao, Juan Carlos. And then Matti Purtinen from Finland is saying that, have you tested APM head and how it worked to improve our results? Uh, actually, the APM, what it does, it's a measuring equipment. And it helps you to define where the stage of, uh, let's say, and the distortion of your system is. So it's something you might be using after the tuning. Yeah, the APM head um, would mess up the target curves because the target curves that are defined on the market were all defined without the binaural measurement. So it wouldn't work well that way. But the microphone, the other microphone in the APM kit has been confirmed to work with the features we talked about today. So if you have an APM, you have the, the microphone, measurement microphone too. I, I hope that made sense. Tim Weprex says, uh, um, appreciate the info. I will be installing soon. This is my personal vehicle, and this yeah. is very nice to, to, to hear. And Carl, again, is a for the guys who are virtuoso already and may want to now, can you bring 2.0 tune over the 3.0 upgraded DSP as a baseline? Or does it start from scratch scenario? Hey, that is a great question. I think you can import the file as long as you are in the same mode. Like if you created a, a FIR file and then you opened up 3.0 in IIR mode, I don't think you could do that. And if you if you use the graphic EQ function, then I don't think that would that would work. But I think it works the rest of the time. I will check and let you know. Yes, yes. I, I think what you say making sense, uh, Ken. Uh, but yes, let's double check on this as well. 
And Steven is saying, where do I get the software? All this on web page, where do I get info for the software is released? Well, Steven, you can contact Alex, of course. We will be sending out a newsletter or even I will call you up when it's ready, okay? So Elnor was asking if there is a white paper to read about Percept and there is a white paper that is not finished yet. Um, uh, yes. But uh, at some point it will be finished and then we will publish it um, because yes, it is very cool technology. Yes, yes, yes. And um, by Elmar, I miss you and I miss German beer. <laughs> okay, we got a lot of questions. This is great. Um, Will it be possible to use on OEM system integration like GMC, Toyota, and Kia? McGill, um, the current level of D-phase at 2.0 is, is continued on with improvement. So it's supposed to, the goal is to allow you to integrate with vehicles that have phase processing. Now, I personally break vehicles that have phase processing into two groups, okay? They're simple and complex. So if you get really complex, to me, that is a Bose system and a GM. <laughs> a Bose system with a GM, I've published some tips that maybe your distributor has or maybe he needs to get them from Luca or whatever. But in some cases, it is quicker for you to use the processing they did than to try to undo all of it. But... If you have a Tacoma with, without JBL, or if you have a Subaru without Harman Kardon, or if you have um, some Kias without a branded amplifier or, or Hyundais without a branded amplifier, then you can undo those phase processings with the phase for sure. But when you get into the most complex systems, it may be quicker to use them than to try to fight with them, if that makes sense. Okay, so there is Richard Lapre that's saying, uh, when you do the setup manually, will you be led through the setup also step by step? Or I think it refers, I hope, I, I think, yeah. Well, I the guess. wizard will still be continue on, yes. right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So what about IIR with 3.0? Um, IIR with 3.0 is, is essential. It's the only reason that this could be um, actually performed. And that is, oh gosh, my, who, oh, uh, Scott asked that. So yes, uh, it's definitely there. Another question is about pass-through mode. We met some limitations about, um, Dimitri, pass-through mode is going to continue on as it is. Um, I, there are some, up, uh, some slight improvements that I ran into when I was configuring the system that is being installed in my BMW right now, retaining the Logic 7 upmix system. So maybe we are talking about the same things. I'm not sure, but I will offline. We can talk about what is being um, updated. It is not a wholesale change, but there are some small improvements that are essential for what we're trying to do. So there's Steven Seiler again from uh, from Austria and is saying about the version. Can I modify my file or do I have to start from sketch? We're quite uh, sure and confident that uh, if you are, were in IIR mode, you can reuse and FIR mode, you can reuse, but we will clarify and state this for sure, even uh, together with the readme files as well. Let's see. Oh. Um, okay. Um, and, I'm going to uh, move this over so I can see it better. I look like a goofy. There we go. <laughs> for those who want to contact and still have some questions for us, they, they can do it. And we're always available to help at this email address that Ken is uh, highlighting on the screen. And uh, support at electromedia.it any time for you and I try and the people to reply within the soonest and don't forget that you will have the replays on the Audison official YouTube channel and that this is the one and only and also Ken will be showing you the slide within the soonest uh, let's see there um, we go here we go that's 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 a great channel guys don't miss even a video in that 
and um, and stay tuned for the next Electromedia live events. Now, it's really time to go. Ciao, as we say, dall'Italia. And thanks to everyone and farewell from the U.S. Okay. Thank you for being with us. Keep in contact. Stay tuned. Bye.